Kimberly and Amaya, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm just going to get right into the questions. So the first question is, what inspired you to establish the Brown Beauty Co-op? That's Amaya's question. <laughs> She's our go-to for that question. <laughs> we, we have a fun rhythm that we use for answering questions. So this is mine. So we started the Brown Beauty Co-op in 2018 with the idea and thinking that uh, women of color and people of color and people who look like us deserve to shop in a space that was warm, welcoming, inviting, um, had products for them um, and where they weren't made to feel like they were a marginalized market or just had one aisle or just a few products um, dedicated to them. And so, we honestly were wondering why nobody else started the business before us. And we thought there was a huge need in the market and we really came to it from consumers and our expertise of being beauty girls um, who loved like makeup, hair and all things and figured if no one else was doing it, then why not us come together, use our creativity, our resources and our backgrounds to create this space and this community for people who look like us. Great, and you all are best friends. So what is it like owning a business with your best friend and how do you solve differences? Sure, so, um, well, the one thing about this business is that it was consummated over drinks at happy hour, <laughs> okay? So as friends do, we were out, um, you know, just a normal happy hour and also thinking about business. And so um, as business partners, it's been, it's been an interesting journey in that we hang out a lot, we travel together. In addition to now we have this whole baby, it's our baby that is, is a business. And I think, um, you know, one of the things, the challenges with being friends with your business partner is knowing when to turn the friendship hat on or the friendship light on or um, versus the business light. And you want to do your best to separate the two because they're just totally different relationships. Um, so how, you know, we just have, have to navigate that. Sometimes it's like, okay, wait, this is a friend conversation. So we are not going to talk about business. We're not talking about the Brown Beauty Co-op. This is just you know, Kim and Amaya speaking. So that I think is a business challenge is knowing when to turn on and when to turn off um, so that you can have those relationships. I just kind of isolate them in a way and just not have them kind of bleed over into each other because they're so different. And the beauty industry is so saturated right now. What advice do you have for future beauty empire bosses or the ones trying to come out now? Well, I would say, um, and Kimberly can add to this if she has thoughts, is don't, don't be afraid and deterred by the fact that there are so many beauty products and so many entrepreneurs out there. There is a niche for you and there's a customer waiting for you. Um, we know this because, you know, we had an idea that we were honestly surprised that nobody else had taken advantage of. And so, um, I think beauty is a market that, um, you know, survives a lot of ups and downs of the industry. Um, you know, personal care is something that people will always um, be interested in engaging in. And I like to call it the affordable luxury. And so there's, there is room in their space for more entrepreneurs. And I think what we've seen in the last year, which has been really important is that you know, diversity in the beauty industry and inclusion in the beauty industry is still a fight that we're fighting. And so while it may feel like we're saturated, we're still not um, catering to folks um, who necessarily look like us. And there's still a huge market need um, to be more inclusive about the offerings. And so there's a lot of room for entrepreneurs who have the drive and the creativity. Yeah, and I would just add on that. I mean, because the industry lacks inclusivity, that is where opportunity lies. So I don't really believe that it's so oversaturated because I believe that there's still so much white space to be filled, um, especially by people of color founders. Um, you know, whether you look in a personal care category or the body category, we know um, that 
from market trend reports that those categories are going to pick up this year. How many people of color founders do you have in those categories right now? And it's not many. Um, so there's definitely room for people of color founders to come in and make an impact right away. And what beauty brands would you say are appealing to women of color and what strategy, what strategies can other brands utilize to attract women of color? I think there's a lot of great products out here that are um, intentional in creating products for women and people of color. You know, we've seen a huge trend around neutrals. Like that's a big thing that wasn't part of the market before because we were all told that neutral was like a paler or peach shade. And we know that that's not neutral for us, right? And so mm -hmm. I think folks who are catering to that specifically um, are really attractive to our community as well. I think for, for hair care and natural hair, what's unique is our hair is different from you know most other folks, um, especially black and brown folks. Although I, I should like back that up to say that most of the world has curly hair and all of us spend time trying to figure out how to straighten it, <laughs> um, including a lot of white women, right? And so um, I think there's a niche there to easily target our community with um, products that are really steeped in expertise. The expertise that we have because we know and we have lived experience with our own hair that other communities that um, don't know as much about our hair care and our routines and our regimens um, don't have that advantage. So I would say um, for brands, folks focus on neutrals. Um, and again, na like natural hair has always been a burgeoning huge market. Yeah, I mean, I would say listen to what consumers are complaining about. You know, if you go on social media, you will see um, so many people talking about different things. They're talking about they have acne or like right now, mass knee is, is a big thing. Um, they might have um, pigmentation issues. You know, customers are screaming out on what they need. And if you are a product developer, you just have to listen and see what people in real time, what they're talking about and where their pain points are. That would, to me, is the easiest thing to do is to solve a problem. Like what is your solution to something that's going on? And for sure in skincare, we know right now that there's a lot of different issues that we're having with our skin that so many of us are just so frustrated and we're just trying any product <laughs> that we think will help right now. So I definitely think just speaking to, you know, what is of the moment. And we know right now with COVID that we're all experiencing certain things like with our hair, with our nails, not going to the nail salons and, um, you know, again, with, with the mass knee. And we're so concerned now with our bodies and spring and summer is about to come out in some capacity, we're hoping to be outside. And so what are we gonna be looking for when we go outside? Um, so just listen to you know, what consumers are, um, are talking about and find solutions. Yes, and I love that you touched on um, the different trends because a huge trend now is clean beauty. I mean, it's really dominating the industry. And so what other trends do you see emerging in the near future? Well, I definitely see there being a trend of dialing back this clean beauty um, and more so to a conversation about transparency um, because there's so many different definitions it, because it's self-defined on what clean beauty is. Um, that so many people are just overwhelmed by it. So I definitely see there being a movement towards just being transparent about what you're putting in the ingredients, not so much about what, what's not in it, but what's actually in it. And what are these, what, are, what do these ingredients do for me and what's the benefit? Um, also, I think there's a move um, to, to minimalism. Um, you know, we've been in this whole like 10 step skincare routine for a while and people are just so overwhelmed by that. Um, and you know that you, it doesn't take 10 steps <laughs> for you to have healthy skin. Um, so I definitely think it's going to be um, paring things down to just effective solutions that won't take you forever to do um, in the morning and the evening. Um, so around skincare, that's what I think for sure we are moving to. Yeah, and I'll just add to what Kimberly said on um, the green beauty trend. I think, and I'm hopeful that we are moving towards 
a more um, holistic like view of green and clean beauty. I think um, because uh, mainstream market of like mostly light white lead like beauty um, influentials have turned this into a trend, right? And we know as black and brown people, we have been herbalists for centuries. Like that's in our ancestry, right? And that is clean green beauty, right? And we also know that you know, companies can stamp the label on something, but still be like over farming and or over sourcing in places where black and brown people are the predominant and majority. So I think like we need to really like look holistically um, about how we're using that term, right? And how we're, we're being inclusive and equitable at the same time that we're being green and not like co-opting right um a lot of what is like you know native to us and part of our heritage and our ancestry and ensuring that it's not like a whitewash movement right and that we have a lot of um ownership in this movement and what is what is like a real green clean sustainable sort of beauty industry look like that's inclusive and one of the things I love about Brown Beauty Co-op is that it's not just a one-stop shop and it's, it's an amazing shopping experience, but it's a place for beauty events and emerging beauty brands to showcase their products and services. So in such a, a competitive industry, how do you manage to keep a sense of community amongst women of color owned brands? Oh, I would say we... Um... We've had a great experience with that. I mean, we just did a workshop a few weeks ago for um, you know up and coming entrepreneurs in the beauty industry or entrepreneurs at all stages who are looking to break into retail. And we uh, featured as part of the panel, uh, other retailers who are in the space just like us, right? And we also featured a panel of brand owners, right? And so what might, uh, people might regularly think as like competitors or are competitors, right? Or in the same space. And we talk community and sharing knowledge. And I'll let Kim talk about this too, because she has a good line about, um, you know, what we think is like, <laughs> she's trying to remember <laughs> what her line is, but she does have, we, I mean, she talks about how, you know, who our real competition is and not us, <laughs> right? Because we're up here thinking like black and brown women are our competition. Um, but there's like mega millionaires and billionaires out here, but we're trying to get a piece of that pie. So, um, I think there's lots of room in this space um, for us to be collaborative and build each other up while we're building brands and building our influence and our access in this industry. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it it's also tells a really good story about, and I, I don't think it's overused to say um, collaboration over competition, but like that is really a, a thing. And it's, it's, it's something that I know we for sure take seriously, hence, the co-op is in our name, cooperative. And I think for black and brown businesses to really be successful and for us to, you know, start to build uh, more legacy businesses, we have to be willing to collaborate. And you can't look at the next person simply as competition and you're just trying to, you know, elbow them out, find ways to work together so that you both can grow. And I guess what, you know, what Maya was alluding to, I was saying that specifically for us, you know, we are black owned retailer and we're trying to elevate the retail experience. And in our, on our workshop, we had four other black owned retailers and they're doing things in a different way in which we're doing it. But some from the outside would say, okay, they are your direct competitors. So why would you work with them? And we found in this conversation that we were just genuinely happy to be speaking with one another because we're small businesses. We need the support as we all know, you know, a lot of us have had to self fund. And so you're trying to find expertise in any way in which you can find it. Why not look to someone who's in a similar position that could lend some type of services to you? At the end of, at the, end of the day, our biggest competitors are the Big, the big box retailers, they are the drug stores, they are the grocery stores. 
we are competing against them. We're trying to take the market share because a lot of the customers that we're trying to get to are currently shopping there and don't know that there's options for them, that there's a different experience in how they can shop. So we're trying to get those customers. I'm not trying to get the customer from the next black owned beauty retailer. That's not going to make me rich. <laughs> so we really need to find ways to collaborate. And I think it's really great for just to have that conversation so people can know that you you, you can be successful working with other like-minded individuals that may be doing the same thing that you're doing and just find creative ways to collaborate. Yes, I love it. So what are some challenges you all experienced throughout your journey and how did you overcome them? Well, I would say COVID <laughs> because we never anticipated that as we were planning for this business and going into it. I don't think anybody could have planned um, or really anticipated as a business person that the world would shut down. And especially as um, a business that really designed itself to create a retail experience that was um, you know, interactive and one-on-one -on -one and really a sense of community. It was a huge, huge you know, sort of pivot for us to really figure out like what we did and what to do in the last year. And we're, you know, we're really two years into the business. Um, so that was definitely, I think a huge challenge. I think, you know, another challenge has been uh, really figuring out sort of, you know, how do we utilize the opportunity? I think, I think we've gotten a lot of great reception from opening the business. And I think there's, there's a lot of potential, right? And so the question is like, what do you focus on, right? And how do you take advantage of all, like all the opportunity, right? And sort of balancing everything that sort of comes with, um, you know, the community being excited that, you know, folks like you all <laughs> being excited that uh, we exist and wanting to engage with us. So, um, you know, all challenges that we've like worked to overcome, but uh, interesting thing that we may not have anticipated. I think um, for sure funding. Um, and that's something that, you know, we're, we still work through every day. And, you know, as a small business, um, you know, small businesses that are self-funded, that to me is the biggest challenge. Um, when we know that, um, you know, for Black women, we even in 2021, even despite, um, you know, everything that happened last year, you know, we are still, you know, really underfunded compared to um, our white counterparts that are doing the same things that we're doing. You know, there's businesses that, um, you know, receive investments just from the point of concept. Um, and just says, hey, I have this great idea. Oh, okay, great. Here's money. Like, let's see it grow. Versus, you know, we, we know that this business um, is it's a smart business um, to the fact that, I mean, there's a lot of different businesses that are coming after us that are doing the same thing, trying to reach that same market because we've been ignored for so long. But at the same time, you know, we do struggle to get um, the type of investments for us to grow at a pace that similar, similarly situated other retailers that we are kind of compared to in, in a prestige level have gotten early on in, in, in their uh, early on in, in, in their business um, cycle. So I think that's something that um, it's, it's a long term thing that, you know, for us and other small businesses that are situated where we are, we'll have to continue to just advocate for ourselves and find um, unique ways of funding ourselves and um, finding different methods to grow our businesses um, in a way that um, truly we can build some type of sustainability with this. Um, and, and that's just something, it's, it's ongoing. So it, it's one of those things where we can talk about it, but it's something that you know, exists right now. Um, and we talk about it all the time that um, you know, we're still just trying to find ways um, just to make it known that, hey, you know, Black women businesses, you know, we keep starting these businesses, but we want to see businesses that are starting actually succeed past the three and five year mark. Um, and I think that's really important overall um, for society in, in general um, to make sure businesses that we're starting actually survive. Thank you so much, Kimberly and Amaya. Um, that was all the, those were all the questions I had. <laughs>